Well, hello there, watching the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages. In the next half hour, then, we'll see what's making the headlines. With tonight, the chief leader writer at The Observer, Sonia Soda, and the former Conservative special advisor, Anita Boteng. Welcome and great to see both of you. As ever, though, we turn our attention, first of all, to the front pages. Ten days in a hotel room, or it's ten years in a cell if you lie. That is the UK government's tough new quarantine rule for international arrivals, and that is the lead for the Metro. The move has been criticised by Tory MPs and travel industry bosses, according to The Telegraph. The tightening of the rules for those arriving from so-called red list countries also makes the front page of the Financial Times. Travellers will have to pay £1,750 for their stay in quarantine facilities, according to the Yorkshire Post. That is also the main story for The Guardian, Covid travel rule breakers facing a risk of 10 years in jail. The Sun has an exclusive about the effectiveness of Covid-19 vaccines. Just one dose offers two-thirds protection against the virus, according to data from the rollout. Everyone is a winner, they say. While The Eye reports that new Covid variants are under control. Daily Express describes the reintroduction of parking charges for NHS staff as a kick in the teeth, despite their work during the pandemic. Daily Mirror reports there's an outcry as some of the permits could cost staff up to £500 a year. And the Daily Star offers readers the chance to imagine Piers Morgan. Do we have to, as Prime Minister? <laughs> well, anyway, yes. Fascinating. Uh, so, Sonny Soda and Anita Boteng are here with rather more serious matters, uh, not least 10 years in prison, if you look at the Metro, Anita. Goodness me, I, th I imagine there was a sharp intake of breath in the, in the House of Commons today. Absolutely. And it's very interesting that Matt Hancock kind of prefaced it by saying, I make absolutely no apologies for the toughness of this measure. And I think that really speaks to the intention here. And it's not to lock people up for 10 years, but to act as a very serious deterrent and encourage real compliance and honesty about all the people that have been in these red flag countries over the past 10 days. Yeah, and the difficulty is that other nations, like South Korea, for example, they track your credit card or your debit card details. They basically, uh, we would argue, impinge our, our privacy in order to track us. We're still not doing that, are we? So do you think this might work, Sonia? And is it the right thing to do? I mean, I think it's, it's certainly quite the deterrent, isn't it? The idea of five years or even 10 years in prison. I'm a bit cynical about this. I think the government really wanted a headline to sort of grab people's attention and maybe shift the debate away from whether these measures go far enough. It's been a big debate about that in the last few years, it, the last few days, rather. It does feel like it is, doesn't it? Um, you know, is it enough to just say that people coming in from the 35 red list countries have to quarantine in a hotel or should it be everyone? And, and by sort of announcing this prison, potential prison, sentence, the government has really shifted the headlines onto that aspect of the debate. I mean, it does feel like a massive, massive deterrent. Um, I think it does raise questions, though, because you know, they've, that there are a number of questions that have been raised today about how this is going to work on a practical level. So, for example, if you've got people coming in from a red list country, there's no way of knowing exactly who they are as they come through the airport. So the government is really relying on people being honest and self-declaring. And £1,750, which is the charge that you've got to pay to quarantine in a hotel for 10 days and to take the tests on day two and day eight that the government um, are now going to be requiring you to to take. You know, that's a, that's a huge chunk of a charge. So I think the government has probably looked at this and thought, we just simply don't have the capacity or the wherewithal, perhaps, to track people coming in from what country they're coming in. We've got to rely on honesty. And actually, it, given the charge is so high, we're going to have to really scare people into doing this. So I think this is kind of where it's coming from. Yes, indeed. And we are reminded, are we not, that it is illegal to travel outside the UK right now, unless there are exceptional circumstances. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if those are exceptional circumstances and you're willing to pay that £1,750, then so be it. Scotland's reacted differently, hasn't it, Anita? Decided that all travellers need to hotel quarantine. And do you think this stiff penalty is a way of getting around that criticism that the 33 red list countries don't go far enough because clearly people can get joining flights, can't they? Well, 
I think the purpose of this is really that point to reinforce and underline the fact that people should not be traveling unless absolutely necessary. And, and that is really the key here. We're not saying every family that fancies going over to Greece is going to have to do this. The purpose is to discourage um, this kind of travel. So I think it is proportionate when you factor that in. And just to pick up on this point that Sonia made about, um, you know, the government really just relying on people to do the right thing. I think that's been the government's approach through this entire pandemic. It requires everyone to be responsible, to take personal accountability and to really act within the letter and the spirit of the rules. And I think we're seeing that continued here with a bit of underlining to reinforce the point that there will be enforcement action if you don't comply. Yes, and the Daily Telegraph, Sonia, really kind of brings it home, doesn't it? Ten years in jail for holidaymakers who lie about going to Portugal. That just feels a bit near. <laughs> It does, doesn't it? I think what's interesting is actually the criticism has come from all wings of the Conservative Party. So you've got people who would be traditionally be seen as being on the right of the party criticising this, but you've also got Dominic, you know, a lawyer like Dominic Grieve um, criticising this. He's sort of considered to be more on the kind of left of the party. And I think there is a concern about introducing penalties as grave and as serious as this through secondary legislation. You know, it's not being scrutinised scrutinised by Parliament in the way that you would expect for uh, something like this, I think. So I think that's where the concern comes from. But I, I do think that we shouldn't let the debate about the penalty distract us from the real question, which is, you know, what is the point of this policy? The government says it's about reducing uh, the risk of new variants like the South African variant that, you know, may prove to be more resistant to vaccines from coming into this country. Now, if you're only going to prevent travel, if you're only going to say that people have to quarantine in hotels coming in from, uh, you know, quite a discreet number of countries and you're waiting for countries to sort of find these new variants, track them. Lots of countries don't have the level of genomic testing that we do that enables you to find a new variant quickly. Um, you know, it, it does kind of beg the question because you do sort of feel that probably by the time that we've discovered a new variant and the government's taken action, it will be too late and it would have already come into the UK. So I think that's why some people are asking the question. If you look at countries that have been really successful at not getting kind of new strains uh, and, you know, you know, COVID spreading through people coming in through international travel, they've taken a more blanket approach than just looking at, say, you know, 33 discrete countries. And as John Ashworth, the Shadow Health Secretary, raised in the Commons today, not every country that has got known cases of the South African variant is on that list. And he was asking why. And I think it is a good question. Yes, indeed. And we have, as we're reminded again, all this genomic sequencing. So we find these variants not necessarily to the benefit of the UK, because obviously nobody wants us as travellers right now, do they, because of the Kent variant. Um, are you confident, do you think, that this argument, oh, the horse has already bolted, can be solved by the surge testing, which is already underway, Anita. Both tonight we heard um, in South London and then in uh, Bristol and Manchester, where the Kent variant has developed the mutations of the South African variant. So a, so a kind of double whammy there. Um, do you think the surge testing can keep it, keep it in check? Is that the, the hope of government? I think there's no silver bullet. So it's got to be the surge testing alongside the vaccination because ultimately coronaviruses do not mutate very easily. And one of the reasons why they are mutating so much is because there's just so many cases around. So if the government can combine this surge testing with the vaccination, I think that really will make a considerable difference. And just to respond to this point about um, new strains, the key point that Matt Hancock announced today was specifically that actually they're going to introduce genomic testing for those passengers that are coming into the country on day two. So we will be able to identify new strains. And that genomic testing will apply to anyone that tests positive coming from whatever country. So the government will be able to identify other countries that, sh that have new variants or should be on the list of 33. So I think this is going to deliver a real step change in the government's response. Yes, global uh, cooperation, because uh, presumably they'll pass that information back to those nations, won't they? Um, on to The Guardian, just quickly then, Sonia. <clears throat> Similar sort of uh, front page there, but they've started talking about people who could bypass the Scottish rules. I mean, you've got layers of complexity of bypassing this, haven't you? Because clearly Scotland's gone further and suggested that all passengers need to go into hotel quarantine. 
Yes. So um, Scotland says it doesn't matter where you're coming in from. If you're coming into Scotland, unless there are kind of real extenuating kind of circumstances, you have to do your 10 days of quarantine in a hotel. And what it raises questions in a devolved nation like ours, where Scotland's going down uh, one approach, England, Wales and Northern Ireland are doing something different, is that obviously raises concerns. So the Scottish government is saying if you're coming to Scotland via England, then you it doesn't matter what country you're coming from. You have to do your 10 days of quarantine in a hotel. But there are real questions about how you would enforce that. Um, you know, there's obviously, it's very expensive, the £1,715. So, um, you know, people might have an incentive to sort of fly in through England and then cross, you know, drive up to Scotland or get the train up to Scotland. So I think it, it just, you're right, it's a very, very complex issue and it raises all sorts of questions. We're an island nation, but when different bits of the island go, down um, different paths when it comes to international travel. That does raise questions about how you coordinate and how you make sure that a different policy applies for Scotland consistently in a way that means that people, you know, can't get around it. And elsewhere in pandemic news, uh, a couple of the newspapers, Anita, talking about £500 parking charges for NHS staff. Um, tell us about this one. Is it, is it one trust in particular? Yes, it is. And I think, you know, hospital parking charges have been a big political bugbear for the government for a very long time. I'm sure some of your viewers will remember um, Rory Stewart during the 2019 leadership election pledging to make them free. And the government has provided a lot of investment to do so. But it does seem like one of the trusts hasn't been able to, to deliver on that. And so I think this is absolutely the wrong time um, for them to be going through those struggles. And I really hope that they manage to find a way to, to really alleviate the pressure. Um, I do think this is going to be a continued debate. You know, how much can we compensate and reward the amazing doctors and, and, and nurses that have worked incredibly hard and, and obviously care home workers through this entire pandemic? And is that going to be, you know, pay rises, anything like that? I think that will be a continued debate in the coming months. Yes, indeed. And this is Epsom and St Helier NHS Trust, which has blamed rising demand. Uh, and the mirror with a quote here from a worker saying, but we've had staff die. So I think, uh, you know, as you say, these issues will be part of the debate in the months and weeks ahead. Well, political still to come, including the start of the former president Donald Trump's second impeachment trial, that and more after this. I'm Siobhan Robbins, Sky Southeast Asia correspondent in Bangkok. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm so proud of her. She, in first lockdown, um, when she said that she wanted to raise some money to help some charities that are really close to our heart, I was so proud. And um, she raised an incredible amount of money. Um, and it wasn't easy for her. She's, you know, she got on the treadmill most days and, and powered away on there. Um, this time she's a little bit stronger. Um, she's been working hard with a physio and um, she said that she wanted to do it again. And um, we said, um, you know, it might be a little bit more difficult this time with a, a full day of homeschooling as well. Um, but she was determined that she she was going to do another marathon. So hats off to her. She you know she's um, she's really good. My left leg when I walk about three hundred meters, my left leg really starts to hurt, and I have to stop. And then I walk again, and then I stop. So it takes a bit longer to um, walk round. But I do it anyway. Cause... Yeah, it's really time consuming for her, but she's determined to do it. Clearly, not had very much to eat at all. A lot of them extremely thin. I'm Alex Crawford, and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. The people here are praying quietly to themselves. They're becoming very sensitive about having the media around. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in the news. They have no protective masks or protective equipment at all. There's a lot of action going on. A lot of... Still. 
every time they touch them, they sprayed, sprayed, sprayed. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. This is what makes the job so fantastic. For the early risers. As we examine the story beyond the headline. For the knowledge seekers. Welcome to Divided States. For the straight talkers, the curious, and the ones who want to be entertained. Backstage Sky News' entertainment podcast. For wherever you are. Welcome to the Sophie Ridge on Sunday podcast. For the ones who want to know more. Welcome to the All Out Politics podcast. For the listeners. From Sky News Storycast. Sky News Podcasts. Listen and subscribe for free. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me now, Chief Leader Writer for The Observer, Sonia Soda, and the former Conservative Special Advisor, Anita Boateng. Welcome back to both of you. Um, so, impeachment of the former US President. Um, does he already feel like yesterday's man? Should it be going ahead? They've been debating that today, haven't they, Sonia? But it's uh, the top picture story there for the Financial Times. That's right. And today, really, the first day of the trial was all about whether it's constitutional to try him um, uh, for these crimes or not, because he's no longer in office. Um, I think it's just happened hot off the press. Uh, the Senate has voted to proceed with the trial. But I think neither the Democrats nor the Republicans really want it to, to drag on for too long. Uh, we've got President Biden in office now. Um, you know, he's got a huge amount to be getting on with, with COVID. Obviously, there's a clear point of principle here, which is that, uh, you know, Trump did incite, uh, you know, an insurrection um, in the Capitol. And so there's a point of principle about the trial proceeding. But most commentators think it's quite unlikely that the Senate will convict him because um, it requires a two thirds majority in the Senate. They're obviously split very 50-50 with Kamala Harris with the casting vote. So it's very unlikely that the Democrats would get the 67 votes in the Senate they need to convict him. So I think it will be about, you know, going through the motions, hearing some of these arguments. But most people think it isn't going to last the three weeks that, that Trump's last impeachment trial lasted. Yes, and the basic charge, obviously, of uh, incitement is um, refuted by his supporters and many Republicans too. So we'll see what happens in the in the coming days. Full coverage of that tomorrow. Uh, but let's move on to Anita the Guardian, shall we? Um, which is this cladding safety crisis post Grenfell, which has left many homeowners and uh, and leaseholders in in a really difficult situation, hasn't it? Yeah, and it's been particularly tough, even for, for first-time buyers, a lot of people that would be considered themselves conservative voters, and the spectators done a lot of campaigning about this too. Um, so essentially, these are homeowners who have bought flats but have found that they actually have this cladding that's very expensive to, to replace, and they cannot sell it either. So it seems as though Robert Jenrick has been negotiating hard behind the scenes with Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, and they've agreed a package of financial support to help these homeowners and I don't think it can come soon enough. 